All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's Pat here and Happy New Year to you and everybody who is watching with you. Uh, we have not just Team SPI here with us, but we have some members of SPI Pro here with us as well. And if you're watching live on YouTube, say hello in the chat. Tell us where you're coming in from. Today, we're going to be talking about online courses. I know because we've asked a lot of people in pro and just in general, what are your goals for 2022? And many of you said that you want to create an online course that works. And perhaps you've wanted to create an online course in the past, and it was just super overwhelming. There's a lot of course that goes into that. But at the same time, we know it's possible. It's possible. We know this uh, from our end because it's worked really well for us. We've made seven figures, well over seven figures over the last several years creating online courses. And recently, we've been more purposefully helping people create online courses too. So today, it's not going to be very structured in terms of here's step one, step two, step three. We have courses. We have something at the end that we're going to share with you uh, more about that. We have a lot of free resources on the website about that. But today is going to be a chance for you to get your questions answered, and specifically, especially those who are in the SPI Pro who are joining us live right now. But before we get started here, uh, let me welcome in uh, Tony, who's going to be our MC in driving a lot of the questions coming in today and, 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 and highlighting the people who are here to ask questions. So, Tony, what's up? Welcome in. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much, Pat. Uh, hey, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm really excited about this. Our first run at uh, doing HOC last year was just so amazing. And I'm glad that we've got some pros in here. We get a chance to chat with. It's going to be super fun. We also have Matt in the house. What's up, Matt? How are you doing? Perfect. Uh, really exciting to be here and a very special Happy New Year to everyone. I know we're getting off uh, on the right foot for everyone this year. Awesome. And I believe we also have uh, Jay in the house who's making his way into the chat as well. Jay, if you have a chance, come say hello. Uh, and then as we are asking questions to those who are in the Zoom with us, uh, you can take an opportunity in the beginning of when we uh, tag your question to um, say hello and introduce yourself as well. So, uh, Jay, are you with us? I am. Hey, guys. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to talk about this. Um, I've learned a lot from Pat and the SPI team over the last year about building online courses and had the pleasure of being a part of the first Heroic Online Courses Bootcamp last year. So um, we can really pack this with a lot of good insight and advice um, based on your questions here about what you're trying to build with your online course. So grateful to be here, Pat and Tony and Matt, to see everybody here from Pro. Uh, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So Tony, why don't you uh, lead the way and we'll just go through cute questions and answers. And, you know, while we're waiting for questions, if there are, uh, aren't any just as of yet, I'd be happy to sort of give a rundown and, and sort of just set the tone, if you will, if there aren't any yet. But if there are, I'd love to answer. Yeah, sure. So uh, let's start off. We've got uh, some pros in the room here. And I would love to just hear uh, from each of you, maybe one at a time, who is just super excited to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about where you're at as far as online courses um, and what's on your mind right now. We'll start We'll start there and go from there. Is anybody feeling like super psyched to kick us off? Otherwise, I'm going to pick people based on their backdrop. David, um, can, you, <laughs> can you kick us off? Would you do me that favor? Tell me who you are, where you are, what you're up to. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> yeah, David Orozco with Orozco Nutrition. I'm in Atlanta. I have a practice, um, been in my practice now for um, about uh, 15 years, and I've been really excited um, to start an online course. What I will say is that I've started a cohort first, and uh, it's a beta group, and uh, we put it out to 25. We're only accepting 10. And uh, deadline for subscription to that was this Friday, and we had all 10 sign up um, as Eight. of Monday. Yeah, so I'm really excited. Um, my question would be, um, I know I'm probably doing things backwards. Uh, most people would probably do an online course first and then do a cohort. Uh, but I, like I said, I'm doing this as a beta, so it's heavily discounted. I want to really learn quite a bit. But um, how do I then take, and maybe this is just an overall arching question, but how do I take this uh, cohort, this community-based peer program into an online type program where I would like to make it a evergreen? I know that um, you all talk about 
it be better that I have an open door, closed door for a certain period of time, but I'd like to really make the cohort, the community peer-based, more the uh, open closed door type of approach versus the online course. So okay. those are sort of maybe a couple of questions in there. David, are you planning to continue to run a cohort-based version of this down the road on top of an evergreen course too? Yes, um, maybe something uh, modeling what you all do with boot camps, but um, I, I'm hoping to do two or three more in each year and um, with a culmination of some type of event at the end of that year where we do a retreat or we, we do a community group face-to-face, uh, mm -hmm. -face, um, bearing more COVID, uh, less COVID uh, um, problems. But, um, but yes, to answer your question. Cool. Okay, so that's good. So if you're going to have both a cohort-based version, which is like our boot camps where there is interactions live, there are Zoom meetings, and there's even breakout rooms, apparent, uh, 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 which can happen sometimes, and you know the accountability is there. If you're going to have an evergreen course to go along with that, you really want to have that strong differentiation between each, right? You know, the outcome may be the same. However, many people do need that additional help and access in order to find success. Others don't. And so what's really cool is the cohort-based version of the course can anchor the price point, for example, for the non-cohort-based version because you're not getting that real-time uh, accountability in those meetings and, and, and those, those kinds of things. But the outcome should still remain the same with the information that's there. And the beauty of this is if you have an evergreen situation, you can get people who sign up for your evergreen course, and many of them are not going to complete it because they just maybe didn't have that accountability and didn't know they needed it. Those are perfect people to then promote the uh, bootcamp style version of your course because you can say, hey, you're probably like me. You need real accountability and connections to people in order to make this happen. And you can even sell it in that way to people who didn't sign up for the cohort in the first place. Insert the evergreen course here. And evergreen, of course, means people coming in top of funnel, finding you on your podcast, your website, wherever, or YouTube videos, uh, and then coming in into a lead magnet, learning more about uh, you and what you have to offer, trust providing quick wins and then going, hey, if you want the real result and, and the end game here, here is the uh, here's a evergreen version for you. And that's just within an automated email sequence, which is really cool. Um, this actually works out perfectly because we just determined what our next challenge was going to be within SPI Pro. And it's going to be related to a uh, funnel from lead magnet to email to course. So that would work out uh, perfectly. And I think that as long as you still have that there, the cohort ver version being something that you sell on top of that, allows you to differentiate it and still continue to make sales from there. So you'll never know until you do it. And you might find that, well, hey, nobody buys the evergreen version, but as long as you have it, it could still be a tool that you could use with your cohort-based version. So it wouldn't necessarily be uh, a, a waste from there. But I, I love that idea. And I think for you in particular, what I know about your brand, uh, that could work out really well. And the cool thing about this is having the cohort and having real testimonials, like I please, as soon as you finish getting these uh, students' results, get on a Zoom call with them and record it and ask them what their transformation was and ask them how the course helped them. That all becomes stuff that could live on a sales page for both an evergreen and a cohort-based version of the course too. So uh, I love that. And uh, a few people in the chat also saying, you know, I love cohort-based first. I think that's great because it'll get you to truly understand the effect that your course and your work will have on people. It also forces you to do the work because you have people sort of waiting for it. Uh, and number three, it allows you to get the kinks out with feedback so that when you create the Evergreen course, whether it's recorded versions of the, the cohort or, or a re sort of shoot of everything in a more um, optimized manner, uh, you know, it'll work out really well. So, um, yeah, I love it, David. Like, good luck and, and hopefully that helps. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Pat. Nobody, awesome. nobody's better at telling you what should be in your course curriculum than the students themselves. They're going to, it's so invaluable, such a great way to get really, really specific guidance on questions you wouldn't think to, uh, to answer um, that, you know, just helps you make it that much more resonant when you turn around and offer that course and those answers back to other people. Nice. I was going to, fr yeah, frame that thought around just product development. Um, so that as a springboard from what Pat and Tony have said is, you know, you, you go into this hopefully with and presuming, you know, a really strong curriculum and model, uh, but then yet yeah, you get to validate things. You get to listen to and capture the actual language that your students are using 
Uh, and then that product development process is illuminating. You know, when, when you do try to go then to a sales page, right? And articulate the real value and the real message that this that this course you know exists for and the in the problem that it's solving. Um, so yeah, uh, not to just wax poetic on on that key point, but it's a really valuable way to uh, do product development uh, ultimately for online courses. Thanks, nice. Matt. <clears throat> Thanks, and Tony. David, and David, you have a in person practice as well. Is that not true? Yeah, that's correct. So, so, so the, this goes the, to a lot of people's questions about, well, how do I integrate the course that I have online with an in, in-person practice situation? And what this does is, right, it allows you to um, reach more people. It allows you to use the internet to sort of serve people that you can't serve in your own local community. Um, and so what are your, just real quick here, um, when is the timeline for the cohort base starting and then your timeline for Evergreen, just so we can kind of get a sense of that? Yeah, so the course starts next Tuesday, the 11th of January. It's a five week. We did it a shortened version. We wanted to do it longer. And then the Evergreen or online course to come out approximately a month to month and a half after that, depending on recording, what we've learned, the data we gathered. Great. And you're setting yourself time to create and do these things like that's in your calendar. Yeah, that that uh, okay, in fact, I, I talked about this with Jay yesterday, but yes, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's really needing to organize and prioritize. And that was the, the big piece of, of this puzzle. Um, I will say the thing that I fear the most is how to put the recording and then to put it as a sales funnel on my website. All of that is brand new to me and stuff that I'm not really good with yet. Um, I know I've, I've heard and seen a lot from you and from other people in this area, but that's where my biggest fear is. That's where I have, you know, all the technical stuff is is uh, where the kinks probably lie. Awesome. Uh, thank you, David. Appreciate it. So let's head over to Heather. Uh, Heather's uh, volunteered to go next. And first of all, where in the world are you that you can be sitting outside during this meeting? And I'm jealous. <laughs> I am. I'm um, in Georgia right now on the Eastern nice. side of Georgia. We're heading to Charleston. I'm about two months into being a digital nomad. So this hey. is all new to me. It's Congrats. been a lot of fun. Um, thank you. I've been in business about four years. I'm a system strategist and I have a VA agency. Um, COVID kind of changed some of, well, like everybody else, right? It, it changed the, the trajectory, trajectory that I thought I was going on. And so, um, I'm very new to the course world. I have assisted other people in courses, other clients, um, but not from the ground up. So I, I'm really in this meeting just to kind of learn more and learn from everybody else's questions. Um, and I'm sure as I'm hearing more questions, those will, you know, those will come up. So, but thank yeah. you for this opportunity. Of course, of course. And thank you. And, and, and to that, I mean, just to answer some of what I'm sure you and many others are, are wondering is like, well, where do I even start, right? And so the big thing here is to understand, okay, well, we need to know who it is that we're serving. That's the most important thing. What are their biggest pains, problems, and frictions, big and small? Like if we have them all listed out, then we're able to sort of navigate this. And better are courses that target a specific problem and a specific solution versus here is a, like, it would be the, the, the difference between I have a health course it's like, well, health is all things about our bodies. Like what, like people, when they search for help, they look for very specific solutions, right? They go to YouTube and they say, how do I fix the ringing in my ear versus ear problems, right? And so when creating a course, we need to think about it very specifically. What is the exact promise and transformation that we're offering our students? Because that is what people are going to buy. That's what they're buying. Nobody wakes up in the morning and wants to buy an online course. But people wake right. up in the morning and want what that online course will give them, right? And the other thing to just set the, uh, set, set the tone, if you will, is this idea that courses are not about how long they are in terms of the value. This was how it was back in the day. Back in the day, the longer the course was, the more value it, it had because just information wasn't always available. Now it's available everywhere. In fact, there's just too much of it, as we all know. So there is value now in how quickly you can get a person that result. I would much rather, and I'm sure you would agree, take a course that only took two hours to get a result versus two months, 
right? It's if you pay for somebody to come and change your tire, it's actually more valuable if they change it in 15 minutes versus, you know, an hour or two, right? And I would pay that person potentially more. And oftentimes when we're coming up with these things, whether it's a service or an online course, we have to remember that people are paying for, yes, the solution, but they're paying us specifically because of the amount of time and education and wins and fails and all the things that we've gone through during the past to get to this point so that I can change your tire in 15 minutes. That's what you're paying for, not necessarily the fact that I'm going to be spending an hour doing this, so pay me for that hour. So hopefully that just sets the tone for what it is that we're offering here, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, it, it does. If I can um, just kind of add one thing I or ask, ask a question based off of that. Um, I, since I'm a system strategist, I deal with, um, well, work mostly with coaches and that's my primary target. And I know that's a wide range. Um, so that probably is another question for another time, whether I need to niche that down at all. But um, I was thinking of doing courses on specific programs because that is what they're having the issue with the tech and that kind of thing. And so um, is that, a good idea or should I make it more general? Um, and then within that course, I guess mm -hmm. that's kind of a open-ended question, right? But yeah, make I it mean, more general within that course to, yeah. To I mean, I, I, I would, I, for, for starting out, pick one specific, specific program that you're going to create a solution for. And that's the course that'll get you okay. um, a lot less to worry about. That'll get you to find the right people who, you know, have that specific problem. A quick story. There was a guy who I knew who um, sold a bug spray um, or I didn't know him. I heard of this story. He sold a bug spray and it was a universal bug spray. It killed all the bugs. And so he bottled it up. It was convenient, right? Cause it killed all the bugs and he sold it and he hardly sold any of them because People have an ant problem, they have a roach problem, they have a spider problem. And so what he did was he took that same formula and he packaged it into an ant killing bottle, a spider killing, you know, all the different bugs. And they just sold like wildfire because, again, people have that specific problem. Now, what's cool about this for you is there might be more programs. Well, pick the most popular one, the one that maybe you're most interested in or you know has the most demand. Pick and solve that problem first and then ask them, okay, well, which one do you want me to solve next? And then they can go from course to course to course. And then over time, you might have a package where for a discount, they can get access to all of them, right? That's okay. the way That's the way that I would approach it. Thank you. I love yeah. that. You're welcome. Good questions. And hopefully in the chat, especially for those of you on YouTube are, uh, you know, I know we're asking just a few questions here and there. I'm trying to incorporate a lot of your questions into these answers as well. Let me know in the chat in YouTube if you are getting value. But uh, okay, Tony, who's up next? Yeah, so we're going to go over to Neil. Neil uh, has a some B2B subject matter to address, which is good because we've also seen some comments in the chat about that. Uh, Neil, do you want to give us a little back backdrop, backstory? Hey, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's 5.20 a.m. here in Australia, so sorry I haven't got my Ooh. makeup on yet. But um, Respect. You look good, it's, uh, it's great to join you. Um, I've seen a shift. I've been selling online courses for four years. My audience are Microsoft IT geeks. And there's been a shift in 21 from probably 80% individuals and 20% companies enrolling people in, in my courses. That's flipped and it's now 80% B2B. Microsoft customers and Microsoft partners enrolling their team in my courses mm. and 20% are individuals signing up. And even those individuals are getting reimbursed by their employer. So it's still a kind of a B2B sale at the end. I'm wondering if other people have seen that and how they've had to respond. I, I find it really challenging because none of the online course platforms offer B2B sales. They can't, they all assume that the person purchasing the course is the student. That's not always true in B2B. And they always assume that the quantity is one. That's not always true in B2B either. The quantity can be 5, 10, 50 or, or more. And so, you know, that, that's one challenge I've faced. I'm wondering if other people have seen that trend and how they've responded too. Yeah, I'm curious, Matt, your thoughts on this from uh, potentially a repackaging of sorts for B2B and companies versus individuals. Any thoughts on that? A few, thank you. And I think Neil's overall assessment is honestly correct and, and kind of spot on, uh, at least kind of maybe working backwards, Neil, with your thoughts that 
Uh, a lot of the platforms right now, you know, are focused on, you know, kind of the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, you know, with creators teaching students in a, in a one-to-one -one manner. Um, we have faced this, uh, I would say, paradox a little bit ourselves. And, and we've had to sometimes operate just through like, you know, mass discount codes and, and sometimes based on certain relationships, uh, transactions that are occurring like outside of the primary payment gateway. Uh, even as an example, uh, I'm proud to say that, you know, SPI and in specifically with our heroic online courses course, uh, we have collaborated strategically with Teachable itself that, you know, all our courses run on and we have participated in some of their past promotions in a sort of B2B relationship. Uh, and then, you know, you strike sort of a, a discount uh, unit level pricing right model. And then again, like the, the payments and whatnot are occurring like outside of the system, but uh what it does create, though, uh, ultimately is, yeah, more work for you. So I, I think one of the, the, the thoughts that I have is, you know, thinking about, you know, for pricing, you know, how much extra time and energy, you know, Neil, are you kind of putting into the deal sometimes, right? Like what goes into that and then being sensitive to those other other aspects of the work and, and the cost uh, that you might have and being conscious of that, you know, when you kind of come up with your bulk pricing terms. So, so that's one thing that really for anyone, you know, that might be trying to think about, you know, kind of creating tiers of, of units, you know, uh, you know, bundles of 10, bundles of 25, bundles of 100 or whatever. Um, be sensitive of, of potential more time and more cost that you're spending into those, those relationships to get the sale. Uh, you should always be conscious of that. So I guess, Pat, that's my kind of key thought kind of going into it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I love that. Um, yeah, the book, that, that's what I was thinking. Like if you have a software, right, you would create a bulk license opportunity, right? And for a course, you can create something similar. I know there's some people in more professional industries that have created, you know, hey, if you uh, have a company who wants to use this, like um, message me, right? It's not necessarily on the landing page or on the sales page, mm -hmm. but it's, hey, let's chat about this and we can talk about the company more and we can talk together about what the needs are, see how many people then come up with an invoice or, or a proposal at least from there. And that's the way... Um, that I would approach it if it's uh, if it's more and more common though you might ha benefit from having like a base price or standard and if like if you have more employees who want to use this contact me uh, after a certain threshold. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've I think a, you. I've got a pricing tier you can buy online and, and at least half of the B two B sales are just online transactions. There's no interaction from me, and Man, that's about crazy. the other half is they contact me and they want to arrange an invoice in their local currency and. They don't want to pay with a credit card and yeah so and it's not the purchaser who's going to be one of the students it's uh, somebody in procurement or finance who wants to buy it for somebody yep. in their customer service team so um yeah and you're handling all those interactions and communication right now yeah yep. it could be a point where and i don't know necessarily where you're at in your business specifically but having a person on your team just manage that so that you can manage this because sometimes it's when you get to this level it's like oh my gosh, there's so much administrative stuff that I need to focus on, but I need to get to this course or I need to create this thing or, you know, record my podcast. But, oh, that thing is like just there that I have to do. You could get some help with that potentially at this point if it start, starts to get, you know, super annoying. Yeah. Well, especially for scale, if, yeah, Neil, if you're really at 80% now coming from these B2B deals, like that's in a way like fantastic, right? And that's something that could scale to Pat's point. You know, think about a VA or an assistant or, you know, if that continues to grow, kind of build out a sales team, a small sales team, right? right. And it's I think it's a really important my, thing. My future oh, course, um, my product planning for future courses is now focused on teams. So the, the next course I'm launching uh, later this month will only be available for teams. And mm, it's, nice. it's, it's to help teams nice. sell stuff. So it's, it's, you know, you can't enroll as an individual. Um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly changing that focus. Nice. Love it. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a quick second here, Tony, to answer some of the rapid fire questions in the chat, if that's cool. Uh, specifically a way to, how do you know that what you're creating in your course or what you're putting in there is what people want? And Andre's asking about, well, can you do surveys, for example? I think surveys are a very, very powerful tool. Um, the more information and the more wants that you can understand about who it is that you're serving in your course, the, the better for sure. Um, at the same time, however, I think that more than just click a box kind of surveys. I think open-ended surveys where you can get actual words and language from your audience is going to benefit you even more. Maybe a combination of both, but polls do one thing. But when you have people respond with, hey, what's your biggest struggle with relation to email marketing right now? And people go, I don't know how to do my funnels. They're not fun at all. 
And that's like, wow, that, I love how that person said that. I'm going to now use that specific phrase inside of my sales copy or inside of email or even use that specific response. Oh, you know, Andre here said that funnels are not fun and it's true, it's not. But in our course, we do make it fun and we have templates so that you can actually get to the fun parts and not the stuff that you struggle with. So definitely open-ended questions and more than that, even just actual conversations where you could continue to dig deeper into what the pain points are for your target audience. But that is a, a, a very great question, similar to Duncan's here. How can you have a course people expect? Um, if that is a question related to marketing, you know, I think that it's smart, much like a book, much like a podcast that might be coming out. To start talking about the fact that you are creating something to solve these problems now, and you look forward to sharing more information about it later. I think the last thing you want to do when marketing or creating a course is secretly create this thing, and then it's ready, and you have the sales page ready, and then boom, hey, big announcement. That's going to catch a lot of people off guard. A course is often not, and, and we recommend that you don't play in the sort of $19 to $49 range, but you play in the upper tier, the, 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 the sandbox of premium, if you will, which – People need a little bit more time to think about how that would be relevant to them and what they're doing. But if you nail the the, the solution and, and the transformation that you're offering, then it's going to be a lot easier for sure. So, um, and then there were a lot of questions here, Tony, about platform, right? And you know, the honest truth, from my opinion, is that yes, we recommend Teachable. That's the one that we use. But honestly, in the end, they all essentially do the same thing. And the most important thing is you just get it done and you get it up there, right? Um, we, we use Teachable and have since the beginning for our free and paid courses. It's worked out really well, and that's what we teach our students and uh, heroic online courses and within our uh, HOC boot camp. But honestly, at this point, they're all great, and, and just the most important thing is just helping your audience, right? Cool. We ready to take so the next Randy question yeah randy was mentioning in the uh, chat uh, a question about b2b sales and i'm just going to drop my answer in the chat but just to say it real quick here if you're selling uh, to somebody who is you know buying it for their company uh not on like a bulk deal but uh you know trying to convince somebody uh in their company to pay for it something like that then the money's not coming out of your pocket and so it's less about convincing someone to spend their money and more about convincing someone that they can sell it to their superior or something along those lines. So cool. um, just a quick note on that. Um, over here in our world, I know Jody said that uh, she was ready. So Jody, if you're still up for it, you want to uh, camera on and say hi to us. Also shots to Mick and uh, little Mick. <laughs> um, who, who have you got there, Mick? This is my son, Thomas, Tony. I'm, I'm uh, dialing in on holidays in Australia from my brother's place. So visiting family, but I didn't want to miss this one. So, oh, Thank you. And hello, Thomas. Beautiful. <laughs> um, Jody, are you still game to join? Otherwise, sure. we'll go to Mick. Oh, sure. yeah, great. Awesome. Hi, Jody. Um, Jody. I'm actually in an office right now where the camera's under a desk, so I don't have ability to <laughs> You're right. Sorry about that. But You're um, right. so I I am starting this journey because I have been in business for over 20 years, um, helping people do online research. And then I had people approach me, mostly like professionals, like attorneys and um, accountants who wanted a cohort kind of course. Um, on what I do. And so I've gotten to the course through that, that arena where I did like lunch and learns for them, which were live as my first foray into doing the courses. And now, you know, I want to try and um, do more. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing all about the B2B sales, because that's um, how it, this has happened. It did require negotiation on price, per yep. student and um you know we did some extra ones that weren't included in the original price so you know i understand the admin part of this because it was pretty and plus they wanted certificates you know so that was pretty heavy on the admin side but it was my first time so now what i'd like to do is uh, and i do have some courses that would be great for b2c and so what i'm trying to figure out is the B2B is so big to do um, with recording. There's 
probably 20 different modules I could do that they usually ask for. I'm wondering if I should do the B2C a couple just to um, kind of figure out how to put one together. I, I, and I am in the boot camp, by the way, that's yeah, just awesome. starting. So um, should I spend that time to just put together a B2C one to work out all the kinks or should I you work on the one that's going to be the bigger money and what people already asked me for? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and, and thank you, uh, Jody, and, and also for mentioning the boot camp. We do have a boot camp coming up starting on January 20th. Uh, really excited about that, and that's for anybody who wants to join us in our cohort-style learning of how to create an online course. You'll actually find uh, the link right there for you on the screen, smartpassiveincome.com slash HOC boot camp in case you want to check that out, and there's also a link in the description. Um, but to answer your question, honestly, I think that you should go with what you know is going to be your bread and butter, and this is this is, in your case, the B2B. Now, here's the big thing about courses as well, especially the first time you launch them. You don't have to create the full course, all 20 modules, in your case, right up front. In fact, I would recommend having a couple ready to go by the time people purchase. But then, you know, the truth is a person wouldn't be able to absorb all 20 modules all in one go, right? So I think that if you had a schedule for the next eight weeks, 12 weeks, 20 weeks, perhaps one module per week for the next 20 weeks. I mean, that's of massive value. It keeps people going and it allows you to have in your own personal life a schedule to be able to create these things and not have to worry about, you know, doing it all up front. And the beauty of this, and this is the way that we've done many of our courses is just having one module ready at the start is we can get some feedback from those students right away as we're creating the next module to make it even better uh, the next time we roll the next sort of sets of lessons out. It's almost like a hybrid of, of the cohort based, which is gonna be you know teaching weekly or, or, or however often you meet, but in a more online sense and positioned as an online course, it's just dripped out over time. And then what's cool is by the end of this, Jody, you'd have all 20 modules done and then be able to just sell it and kind of be done with it. And it's done and it's optimized and you'll have testimonials from people who've gone through it with you. So it, it's it's like a half pre-sale, right? Like there's a, there's a traditional pre-sale, which is I'm going to sell, you know, all of it uh, without having to create any of it yet. And then I'm going to create it as I go. In this case, it's maybe having a couple modules available for people to dive in right away, but then you're creating over time. Does that alleviate a little weight for you, Jody, with the creation of this? Yes, because that's what I, you know, that's what's prevented me from doing it so far is just mm -hmm. the enormity of doing and trying to figure out which one to do first, because they're usually equally um, um, enjoyed, you know, appreciated. So right, right. that helps a lot with that. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jody, th there is a question in the chat here uh, really quick was how do I, when I create multiple courses, like not confuse my audience, right? And I think that this just plays a role and we talk about this a lot within Team SPI and that's clarity and positioning. This course is for these people. And if you're not that, this is not for you. This course is for these people who are, you know, if you're, if you're this and this is your goal right now, then this is for you. If not, then, you know, here's something else. So, the clarity and messaging, if it's even a little bit confusing to you, it's going to be amplified confusion to those who are sort of receiving those messages on the other end. And I think that as long as you are clear and you can easily portray and share the positioning, then it's going to be much more easily received. I don't know who asked that question, but thank you for that. It's always, uh, you can't go wrong. Just it's really zeroing in on what is the thing that they're trying to address? What's the pain point? How can you you know, make it clear, if you are this, go this way. Yep, exactly. Um, let's go over to Mick, if, if that's cool, if you, uh, if you wanted to um, tell us a little bit more. Sure, Tony. Yeah, no Great. problem, sir. So Mick Spears from the Leadership Project, uh, launching a Leadership Academy in just under two months from now. I'm quite excited about that. Um, we're listening to David earlier. Could have been me speaking everything that he said so my plan uh, for my flagship program is a hybrid uh, program it's a uh, eight-week leadership course for first-time leaders so people that have uh, gone into leadership for the very first time uh, my question was going to be about um, whether to do an online course at all because I, I keep on you know doing the research that, that shows that kind of online courses that the, the completion rates are very low and and that the there's not as much transformative learning 
thing for the student because uh, they're not embracing things like collaborative learning and gamification and all the things that come from that community vibe of being on a cohort with with others um, but I had drawn the conclusion you know and listening to to Pat there listening and answering David's question the idea of using online courses as the introduction into then getting them into the cohort based program so they can get base kind of base level knowledge from uh, from evergreen courses and then come through a true transformation through the cohort based program. So um, I feel like my question's already been predominantly yeah. answered, <laughs> but yeah, but, but yeah, really appreciate uh, yeah. This, this group. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you, Mick. And, and thank you, Thomas. Um, yes. Using a cohort base to sort of inform the evergreen version or the online course version, pre-recorded version, and then the pre-recorded version being a precedence to the online sort of cohort-based version is a, is a perfect scenario, right? Um, at the same time, there might be some of you watching this who might be like, well, I don't want to do a cohort base. And if that's the case and you don't want to lead that, then then that's fine too. That's that's okay. But in terms of the evergreen courses or the pre-recorded courses, some people will take that and 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 do well with it, right? And that's great, great for them. But there will be people because not everybody completes those things for various reasons. I think the percentage is very low in general. We hear this because we we take the average, but we're not average, right? We're going to do more than most to make sure and ensure that people do have not just what they need, but help them along the way. There's ways to do that even within a pre-recorded course from emails being sent at certain moments in the course, especially when there's harder lessons coming up or you know, office hours once a week or once a month on top of that, just to kind of allow people to connect and get over those hurdles they might have or um, you know, easy access to you know, a, a ticketing system if they have any questions to, to help themselves along the way. Um, those things can help with a pre-recorded course, but a cohort-based course, I mean, we've had what, like, 98%, 100% success rates with with these things because people are going through it with you and and they get to the end. And not only do they get to the end and have you know a result, they get to the end and they have friends and they have colleagues. And many of the people who have taken our boot camps are still continuing to hang out with each other. And that's so amazing. And that's definitely something you can't get in an evergreen. Um, the big thing here is that as a result, I hope that you charge what you're worth for a cohort base versus what you might charge for pre-recorded. So understanding those price differences anchoring the price from one to the other is very, very important um, because it does take a lot of time to do the cohort-based stuff for sure, but it is definitely worth it. Just, that did actually raise a different question, uh, Pat, when I was listening to you then. Um, what are your thoughts about like assignment work? So on an online course at the end, there being some kind of, not and not a you know, multi-choice easy questionnaire or you know, something like that but genuinely something where they have to go and put put something into application and send it to you and and you yeah. give some kind of feedback loop to them what, what are your thoughts on that have you tried that before thank you mick uh jay if you're available to answer this question uh you've done tremendous work within team spi to help us uh, during our cohorts creating work creating worksheets that people have to turn in and then the idea of like helping people at the end turn something in and, 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 and fill something out based on what they're doing. Jay, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because your, your initial reaction would be that by requiring more work, it would probably lead to lower completion rates uh, and even lower engagement, right? But in my experience, and maybe it's a time we're in because it's different, by creating these assignments that can be completed where it forces you to apply what you're teaching, um, it's, it's really, really powerful. Now, I do think that part of the reason that's working for us is because we are doing this in a cohort-based style, whereas if you simply had your pre-recorded course and then had some pretty intense but like effective worksheets, people probably would pass on them more than you would like. But when you have you know, the forcing function of hey, on Thursday, your small group is going to meet and you're going to work over each other's assignments and give each other feedback on that. It creates a, a pressure and uh, like some positive social pressure to actually do the work to meet the transformation. And we've really enjoyed that aspect of our boot camps over the last year plus, And we will continue to do that. That's how um, Heroic Online Courses, that boot camp is really structured. We have... Um, 
presentations on Monday from Pat. Pat teaches the lessons. Uh, we give you a packet of um, exercises that we work through partially live on those cohort calls. And then on Thursday, we'll do uh, a brief Q and A about the exercises and then have small group work to basically uh, sharpen each other's responses to those exercises. And the results have been really, really powerful. Um, you know, the, the completion rates of pre-recorded courses are often quoted in the single digit percents. Um, and we have, you know, 50% plus of people who continue to go through all the way to the final um, group sessions in our, our boot camps. In addition to those motivation patterns that Jay was articulating, I, I think an, an additional motivation is just the win effect. So going week to week, you know, by having an assignment, and if you can calibrate and design that assignment to be not too too burdensome, right? Like not too much of a lift, mm -hmm. then they're they're seeing results not actually at the conclusion of you know your boot camp four or six weeks later, but they're seeing they're seeing progress every week, right? They're seeing results every week because they've they've gotten over this hurdle, you know, that's that's achievable. That they feel that dopamine, that's a win. I can build on that next week, right? So if you can design those motivation loops, you know, into your uh, cohort curriculum, uh, that's just another added, I think, boost uh, and positive effect for engagement, retention, uh, and then ultimately, I think, advocacy, right? Uh, again, capturing testimonials and feedback and word of mouth, you know, from your students to, to share the good word. Yeah, I mean, on that, I mean, within one of our courses, Power Up Podcasting, for example, I, it's, it, originally was created as a pre-recorded course and then we added a boot camp sort of situation on top of that uh, later um, the cool thing about that is I specifically designed that course in a way to have super micro assignments happen all along the way that all are baked into this process of creating a podcast right so you know nailing your title like that was one video and your assignment in this video is to nail your title you check it off, you mentally go, okay, I'm moving on now. And then you move on to the next one. And you just kind of use the comment section to just sort of pledge that that is your title for right now. Same thing with your artwork and, you know, all the way up to the point where until you have your listeners coming in after you've launched your podcast. And that's been working really well because people see that when they see that. And yes, it is an assignment, but it was sort of the result of the learnings. It's not a quiz, right? Quizzes can work too. Um, but that feels very like, you know, listen to a lecture, then take a quiz to see if you've retained this versus listen to uh, uh, some teaching and then like do the thing and then turn that thing in in some way, shape or form. Right. So micro assignments is, is the way I would consider that as well for both cohort based and, uh, you know, in person stuff, too. So, uh, Mick, thank you so much uh, and, and appreciate you for that. Um, it, I'll add one thing on that, Pat, too, which is that um, in a self-led course, people get stuck. And, you know, if you're going to just do a self-led course, you can try to think about how you design for this as best as you can. But when we put up a cohort version of an existing self-led course that we already had, we had a lot of people who had already purchased the course show up and they said, you know, I, I bought this course a year or two ago and I got stuck. I got stuck on step four of eight or whatever it was. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I got annoyed. I got frustrated and I ended up, you know, walking away from it or, or putting it off. And so giving people a way to get unstuck is hugely helpful. And I think that positive feedback loop of interim wins also helps too, because, you know, if I want to launch an online course and I, you know, there's 10 steps to do it and I get five or six of those steps through, I'm still not seeing the external reward until I've gotten all the way through to the other end. But if I'm in a cohort of people, uh, those people are going to help celebrate and validate the work that I've done all the way up to that point and maybe help keep that motivation up so I get past step six and push all the way through to 10 and get it out there. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. That, and, and that on, raises on the, a, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that raises an interesting point as well. I was going to uh, comment on that. Uh, Tony, is, it's correct, I think that like in Teachable and in Thinkific, you can actually see uh, the, the student's progress, right? So, so that's actually giving you information about where are your students at? Do they get to module four of your eight module course and all of a sudden 
they either slow down or they start pulling out and uh, Matt tells you something and it becomes, I guess, a lead generation for you to go and talk to those students and see if they want to come into a cohort-based program or maybe uh, change up your online course to go, is there something about Module 5 that people don't like? Or yeah. it's, yeah, That's correct, right? The platforms tell you that kind of information. Yeah, yeah that, 100%. That, that, that works. And then a better way to do it, honestly, is just every once in a while, maybe even once a month automatically, just send an email out to all your students and say, hey, where are you stuck? Where are you stuck and why? And then just, again, pulling out that language of whatever it is that they say, you know, oh, the technology was really hard for me and oh, the tech has been a problem. Okay, ding, ding, the tech is a problem. What can I do to now solve that part in lesson two so that they don't get stuck and then everything else doesn't matter after that. So in that case, maybe it is rearranging that lesson to make it more digestible. Maybe it's breaking that lesson into sort of more mini lessons along the way so it's easier to, to absorb. Or perhaps, and I've done this in the past too, where when I found that there's been some lessons that have been maybe harder, I just I just didn't know as much about Facebook ads, for example. Um, I invite a person on and I say, hey, we got a bonus. We have a bonus uh, guest who is now in this course and she is now popping up in this lesson to help you with Facebook ads because that's something that I saw that you needed help with. And then people are blown away. They go, wow you like stepped up and brought an expert in to talk about this. How cool is that? So asking people where they're stuck is, is oftentimes a great uh, indicator as well as those sort of tracking systems that you're, you're able to use as well, Mick. So thank you. And, and by the way, if you are needing some help with your online course, we are running a boot camp very shortly starting January 20th. If you'd love to come in in a cohort style program uh, to get your course done, the transformation is by the end, you'll have a course ready to go and ready to film. Everything else, the planning, the outlining, the how to film it, all that stuff will be ready for you. Smartpassiveincome.com slash HOC bootcamp. There are some people here who are already signed up that we'd love for you to join too. Now there's a question here in the chat from Jessica. When offering one-on-one -on -one coaching slash courses, so one-on-one, -on -one, do you find offering the assignments all up front and they can go at their own pace versus dripping out the assignments over time, pros or cons? So there's a couple of things here. If by assignments, you mean all the, the, the worksheets and stuff that are available in the course, if you mean like having that all up front, it could be pretty overwhelming, right? Imagine going to a course, like an, a university course, and your teacher goes, here are all your assignments for the year. Boom. And it's just like, they're all on the table. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of stuff I got to do, right? So if you're talking about those assignments and worksheets, um, making them up front available may not be the right way to go. Although we sometimes have them available in one spot so that people, when they get to wanting to get to those, they're all in one spot and available and people don't have to search. But if you mean like the lessons, right? In a pre-recorded online course, if, if you're asking about the difference between um, your coursework all being available up front and they can take it at their own pace versus dripped out for a pre-recorded online course, this is really up for debate. <laughs> it, it really is up for debate. I'm more preferential to here are all the lessons available. Here's how I recommend you go through them. Once a day, go through one lesson so that by the end of six weeks, you'll have it all done. You can go faster, you can go slower, but it's up to you. You have it all available. There you go. I think if you do show them all, set that expectation of a, of a rhythm or cadence for people to go through. The problem with drip, in my opinion, is that there are people who might want to get ahead or might feel like it's too slow. And it just, you know, you could take one of two stances there. Okay, sorry, I'm going to open it up for everybody now. Or you can just go, hey, you're ahead of the game. Great. Take this time before the next lesson shows up to make sure you have all these things in place. You double check your answers or, you know, in, if you have extra time, do this until the next week comes. So really, it's up to you. But I feel that um, the drip versus not drip is up to debate for all of our courses outside of the cohort-based boot camps you get all the lessons available and we just set the cadence up front. You can also split the difference a bit where you're giving people access to everything, but you're also dripping out your correspondence to remind them, you know, hey, we're at week two, these are the week two lessons, et cetera. So that, you know, people are getting a rhythm even if they have access to do it at their own pace. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, Spruder, Spruder man. Nice. Uh, if we are not the experts for our course and we want to leverage other experts to create courses mm, and offer them through the yeah. site, um, like LinkedIn learning, what are resources there for how to manage that? 
again, the number one thing is who is your audience and what is going to best serve them to solve this problem? And if you aren't necessarily the subject expert, does that mean you cannot create a useful resource? No, you absolutely can. In fact, I know a lot of people whose superpowers are not the skills that they know, but it's who they know who has those skills. And that is a value. That is a curation model. I'm going to save you time. I'm going to make this worth your money by doing the curation for you and bringing all these experts into one spot. The trouble here is we don't want to just have a giant library of stuff that is seemingly valuable because we're just adding all these experts in there. If there is a step-by-step -step or a blueprint, or maybe that information is something that people would pay for just to have access to it, well then great. If they can't get access to it anywhere else, or if it would be very inconvenient to go out and find that. Um, is anybody else getting feedback? Tom in the chat seems to not be hearing me correctly. You might have two windows open, Tom. Sometimes that is, is the case. Um, so yeah, uh, it might just be a refresh, Tom, uh, if, if that's an issue. Anyway, um, you don't have to be the expert, but I think that you have to be the most passionate person about helping those people solve these problems. And if that passion also includes finding the right people who can solve those problems, then I think that would be uh, the, the right way to go about it. Um, so yeah, let's see here. Uh, what do you think about LinkedIn uh, for courses? Oh, Andre yeah. just uh, dropped a question about that. There was a great question about that earlier. Uh, thank you for tagging that up. There, there's not just LinkedIn learning, right? There's also Skillshare and Udemy and what we call marketplaces, right? Where you could potentially put your course up. Um, now, the problem is you lose a lot of control over how your course is marketed on those platforms. And I heard a horror story once of somebody who spent a lot of time creating a Udemy course specifically, and then one day waking up to thousands of, of new students. Great, until he found out that Udemy promoted his course for free. And now he's not making any money. He's getting more people in his system, but now he has more customers to worry about. And it was like without even any warning. Now this was back in the day. I don't know how, if Udemy does this still, but they oftentimes will run promotions with certain things. And sometimes like Amazon, you can't necessarily control the price points of these things either. And that can be very difficult at times. Um, secondly, I think that if you are going to play in the premium sandbox, again, which is, I want you to consider that what it is that you're creating is the best to help a person solve a problem then I think that you're able to more command higher price points, higher profits, and higher capability to serve that audience through however you want to do that because you're more customized with how you run your emails, how you connect, and office hours, all that stuff. Not to say that's not possible with LinkedIn or anything like that or, or Skillshare, but I don't know. Jay, do you have any thoughts about this? I know that you, know, you have interviewed and have talked to a lot of people who perhaps have had Skillshare and Udemy courses, and you yourself are a course creator. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'm a instructor for LinkedIn Learning also. And let me just say off the bat, that is a publishing agreement with LinkedIn. Um, it's it's almost like a book deal. So you have to be invited onto that platform. You can apply. I'm not sure um, how they manage the inbound of those applications and how often they bring in new instructors from that form. You can just Google that to find it. Um, personally, as, as Pat's saying, uh, the premium sandbox is what I come back to all the time. Because if you do want to put it on a platform like Skillshare, like Udemy, like Udacity. Um, it's kind of a pricing race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And there is built-in distribution, which will uh, help you if you're not coming to your course with an existing audience who wants to learn something from you. If you have something that you just really want to share and you feel like um, you, know, you want to build that course before really building up an audience, and those platforms I think are a really viable place to start. Um, because that can build your, um, your audience, your creative platform in that way. But as Pat said, it's, it's not as economically um, uh, beneficial if you do have your own audience to bring to the course. I, I think the starting point part uh, of Jay's comment there is actually really important thinking about the life cycle of your business. So you know, as you are developing and growing your audience and as you're getting, you know, more reps with students and as, you know, the, the years maybe tick by, you know, growing into more maybe advanced level things, things that are then non-marketplace on your own uh, platform, 
uh, starting to pursue, say you have done more of the evergreen course model and then want to expand into the cohort style as well. Just being conscious of, yeah, uh, and sensible with like where you are in your own journey, right? Uh, as a creator, as an entrepreneur, I, I think it's a really valid and valuable reference point to make some of these decisions. And if you are just more at square one and get started, then potentially evaluating those pros and cons of using a marketplace to the points that Pat and Jay have raised is not a bad idea as a rocket booster to get started, to get some reps, to start building an email list and your name a little bit. It uh, doesn't mean you have to stay there. It doesn't mean that in a year or two, you de-platform from that because you have been successful and you've made some money and you now have a more captivated, uh, captivated direct audience. And then now you're able to sell directly. That's true. That's true. There, there are people who I know who use Udemy to create a lower level, lower tier course, knowing that it's you know not going to be super profitable, if, if at all, but to bring people in to then sell them into on their own, a more advanced or, or boot camp style or coaching of, of some sort. And that could potentially work too. Um, I do want to spend the next uh, two or three minutes here, which is all we have left. Uh, this has been really great by the way, thank you all for showing up. The pros who are here with us on Zoom, just this is the kind of stuff we do and we're gonna do more of it this year. It's just great to connect on these specific topics and I absolutely love it. And thank you, Tony, and uh, for leading and Jay and Matt for being here as well for support. If you want support on your way to building an online course, we do have a boot camp coming up starting on January 20th. You can sign up now. The deadline to sign up is ending very, very shortly. And this is where you and several other students will come in together and learn together. I teach on Mondays and we have working spaces on Thursdays where we can actually get this stuff done together and have that accountability and have the access to a person who can help you along the way. Smartpassiveincome.com slash H-O-C boot camp. That is where you want to go. And I'll leave that up there till the end here. Um, so to answer John's question, I asked a question about how to find someone to fill me demonstrating skills. Jay, I saw uh, your answer about just using your own cameras and your own webcams, if you will. Um, again, the most important thing is that you have the right information and that you at least are audible and, and there's no distractions in what it is that you're filming, right? So if you are filming a course and there's kids running around in the back, well, maybe that's not the best thing, but it doesn't also have to be on a, on a, on a red camera with 8K uh, you know, quality. In fact, I wouldn't recommend that because that's just going to eat up a lot of bandwidth. So minimum viable production is what I would do, that MVP, with perhaps just a webcam. You don't need multiple cameras like me. I know I have the fancy setup, but this was built over years, right? And as long as your audio sounds great, even using your phone could work. I know some people have created million-dollar courses just with their phones and a little lavalier mic to go along with it. And so um, you could level up later to sort of super pro quality uh, and, and just start out with an MVP. And then to finish up here, Sandy is asking uh, again about certain platforms. Uh, she had mentioned one called uh, Zendler I've, or New Zendler. I've never heard of that one, but uh, she also asked about Maven. We actually use Maven for the bootcamp. And again, the link is right there. And Maven's great. We went through a bootcamp that they taught to learn how to run bootcamps and cohorts, and it was really good. And, um, you know, again, if you're doing a pre recorded online course, then you would be more to the likes of something like Teachable. And, and that's what we use as well. Um, so yeah, links in the description for that. And if you're interested in becoming a, a member of pro here, we have pros here who are on zoom with us and we get access to each other all the time. We have challenges, events, and we connect on our very own circle platform away from the noise of Facebook, away from the noise of LinkedIn. If you want to check that out, smartpassiveincome.com slash pro or spipro.com. Yes. SPIPro.com. Yay. We have that now. Yeah. <laughs> Can I, can I say something real quick about Maven, Pat? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, there are some instructors who build an entire online course business from being an early instructor on places like Udemy because it's a marketplace and those marketplaces need sales. Maven is being built to be a marketplace for uh, cohort-based courses as well. I don't think they have uh, just open enrollment. I think you still have to apply to be a Maven instructor, but they want instructors and so there will be some benefit to you if you're running a cohort-based program to consider using Maven because we're early on in the life cycle and they need good courses, they need good instructors. So I would encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. That's just maven.com. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Matt, Tony, everybody here. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic and looking forward to seeing you back in pro pros. And if you want to be in pro next cohort coming up, smartpassiveincome.com slash pro. And again, the boot camp link is right there. We'd love to help you out for the next six to eight weeks, starting January 20 to help you launch your online course and, uh, appreciate you for coming in. Let me know what you thought. Thanks of this. everybody. We're gonna do more of it.